Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being patient with us as we uh, delay beginning our event a little. We have had such great popularity. We are suffering from our own success. Uh, not only was the event sold out, we have a crowd of people eager to get seats who uh, would like to come into the room. If there is a center seat in your aisle that you have been avoiding, if you wouldn't mind moving in to make it a little bit easier for people to uh, fill in the empty seats, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. My name is Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all tonight to kick off our spring calendar with the opening of Gifts of Gold, the Art of Japanese Lacquer Boxes. And I just want to point out we have a lot of fantastic programs coming up this spring. So when you go downstairs, please be sure to grab one of our program brochures so that you can see everything that is coming up uh, later this semester. And it's also my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Eva Kovachi, who is known to many of us in the room as both a professor and a colleague. She is the curator of Gifts of Gold, and she is adjunct professor of art history here at Fairfield University in the art history program in the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. She teaches courses on the arts of Asia and global introductory courses in art history. Eva received her PhD in the history of art from Yale University with a focus on pre-modern Japanese art of the 14th, I'm sorry, and her research focuses on Japanese illustrated scrolls and Buddhist art of the 14th century. She's held fellowships at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Culture in the UK and the Asia Network Loose Foundation Postdoctoral Teaching Fellowship here at Fairfield. In 2016, she was the co-curator of the exhibition Kamakura, Realism and Spirituality in the Sculpture of Japan at the Asia Society Museum in New York City, and was the editor and contributing author of the exhibition catalog. Dr. Kavachi also volunteered for the Westport Public Art Collection, where she serves as chair of the Education Committee. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Eva Kavachi. so much, Michelle, for the kind introduction, and thank you all for coming out on this uh, blustery and increasingly frigid uh, evening. Um, I want to thank the Fairfield University Art Museum for inviting me to uh, put together this exhibition, um, which has been in development over a number of years now, um, which was prompted by the acquisition by the museum of a beautiful uh, writing box with cranes that you'll see in the show. Uh, so that's what really inspired uh, this project and kicked it off. Uh, so I want to thank the entire museum staff, Carrie Weber, the director, uh, Michelle DeMarzo, of course, uh, Megan Pacwa, and Emily McKeon for really shepherding this project along over the past few years. Um, my deep gratitude goes to the lenders of the exhibition, um, private and institutional, uh, and especially to Eric Thompson for working with us on this project. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Um, and also, my gratitude goes to Setsuko and Mike Cooney, who kindly lent some kimonos from their collection to accompany the lacquer exhibition, um, and which will also be really useful in the course that I'm teaching this spring as well. <laughs> Um, I also want to thank my colleagues in the Art History Program and the Asian Studies Department for their support, um, and last but not least, my family um, for love, support, and for putting up with me. <laughs> so let me see if I can get this working. Um, so today's lecture will be an introduction to the exhibition uh, and to the works that are on display and to lacquer as an artistic form. Um, and then I want to also take a bit of a deep dive into two topics that are um, kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, one is the eight views in lacquer and painting, and I'll fill you in on what the eight views are as a poetic and painting theme. Um, and then also on poem cards and fans as motifs in lacquer decoration. Uh, I'll be showing a lot of contextual images today, and so for clarity, I have put the titles of works in the exhibition in gold at the bottom, and any contextual works, works from other collections that are not here for this show will be shown in, in gray or in black, just so that you can keep them all straight as we go down and, and have a little preview of what you'll see once you go into the galleries a little bit later. So my own introduction to lacquer uh, came when I worked um, as a graduate student at the university, uh, at Yale University Art Gallery uh, many years ago now. Uh, for a year, I worked there in the Asian art department. 
Uh, and I was later um, invited to write a short essay on these two objects, which Yale has kindly lent to the exhibition uh, for their bulletin. So that was my introduction to lacquer. Um, and the experience of working in the Yale Art Gallery was really formative for my future teaching and for my interest in working with um, original works of art in person uh, and taking my students you know, to, to stand in front of works of art and to talk about them in a gallery and museum setting. And uh, to, that, uh, to that point, we're extraordinarily blessed to have this museum here on campus and the wonderful complement of exhibitions that are ongoing every semester. Um, you know, we, uh, we, the programs, the permanent collection, and the works that we have on long-term loan really facilitate the kind of teaching that I do and that uh, my colleagues in the art history department do as well. So we're really uh, thankful for that and um, look forward to many future years of, of, of wonderful shows. OK, so let's get into the lacquer. Um, Starting with these you know, two. Could you speak more to the microphone? It's a little proper <clears throat> volume. Absolutely. Thank you, Michelle. I'll try to lean forward a bit. Uh, so lacquerwares and lacquer objects are ultimately functional things, um, as you can see here in this meal table, uh, and a tea caddy that are both in the show. Uh, red and black are the principal colors of um, Japanese lacquerware, although certainly other colors are used in lacquer as well. And as we will see, uh, black and red lacquer also become a base for sprinkled picture decoration in gold and, uh, and other metals on a majority of the, the objects in the exhibition. Um, so this tray that we see here shows uh, signs of wear and use, which relates to that idea of utilitarian function that I talked about. But these are also prized aesthetic qualities. Um, connoisseurs and collectors sought out these kinds of signs of wear and use over time, um, part of the, the aesthetic tradition of appreciating these objects. Uh, but how do we know that they were actually used for these kinds of things? Um, this takes me back to the uh, illustrated scrolls that Michelle mentioned that, um, that I work on in my research. Um, and so here, uh, I show you a scene from a 14th century hand scroll. It's a detail of a, a much larger scene, showing a group of, of, uh, of people eating off precisely the kind of table that we see here in the show. Um, and this dates to the early 14th century, when these types of lacquerwares, uh, negoro wares as we call them, were, um, were being produced and used in temple and then also in, um, in noble settings. Um, other scenes from scrolls show us lacquerwares as well, and it's funny since I've started working on this project, now I see lacquerware everywhere in these scrolls. <laughs> Whereas before, I just I, you know I didn't really pick up on it so much. So this is a scene from a, a mid 14th century scroll, um, where we see uh, over here. This is the kitchen uh, where food is being prepared. That's what's going on over here, uh, and then being arranged on individual lacquer trays that will then be you know, put, brought out to uh, the diners over here. Note also here we have uh, lacquer stirrups on these, uh, the saddles that are hanging here. So lacquerware is used you know, not only for dining utensils and for storage boxes, but for architectural elements, um, for parts of armor, uh, for you know, uh, horse trappings, I guess you call them as well. And so what we have going on over here is a poetry gathering, and that will become relevant to my later discussion of poetry as a theme in, in lacquer decoration as well. Uh, more furniture and lacquerware is shown here, a table, uh, a low table before this icon of, of a poet that's being honored in this gathering, uh, a writing box before this gentleman here, right, with uh, an inkstone as he prepares to, to write a poem. Note also a poem slip here, sitting before this, uh, this monk here. Uh, and I'll make this point later too, but poetry gathering, poetry was a social practice. Uh, people held poetry gatherings, wrote poetry, building upon earlier verses in the tradition. Uh, jumping back a little bit, uh, just to start talking about lacquer as a substance and as a tradition, uh, we should mention Chinese lacquerwares. 
right? These are dating all the way back to the second century uh, BCE, recovered from uh, the tomb, uh, tombs at Mawangwai. And if anyone had the opportunity to see the uh, exhibition Age of Empires at the Metropolitan Museum a number of years ago, uh, they displayed uh, these lacquer wares. And they look really as you know, pristine as, as if they were created yesterday. And that speaks to lacquer's durability as a medium um, and its ability to withstand time and retain its luster and its, uh, and its beauty over millennia. Many of you may also be familiar with uh, the carved lacquer tradition, something that we don't have in the show here today, um, but uh, which uh, was an important part of the Chinese lacquer um, tradition and which were also collected by uh, Japanese uh, nobility and, and shoguns um, and forming part of, of the, the shogunno collections and actually also used in tea ceremonies and, um, and such as well. So I just wanted to show you those before we uh, go any further into the Japanese materials. Okay. So uh, what is lacquerware? What is lacquer? Um, it's derived from the substance of the lacquer tree, which is native to East Asia. Uh, it's a sap, right, that's harvested from making incisions in the tree and, and tapping the, the raw lacquer. Oops, that's not good. Oh, we're back up and running. So if I pull this closer to me, I won't lean against the computer. All right. Uh, and the lacquer tree is a, is a relative of poison oak and poison ivy. The substance is actually called urushiol, uh, right? That gives you the allergic react, a reaction when you come into contact with poison ivy. And uh, the word for lacquer in Japanese is urushi, right? Mm -hmm. So that is, is that, uh, that connection. So the craftspeople that work with lacquer as a substance um, must be sensitized to it, right, to, to avoid um, you know, having, having allergic problems when they work with a substance. So once the, the lacquer itself is tapped and refined and processed, it can then start to be applied to uh, a substrate or built up into to lacquerwares themselves. And this board, which we is, is in the exhibition, shows you various uh, layers of lacquer that can be applied to an object. Sometimes the lacquer is mixed with other substances, um, fine clay powder um, and other things for the lower, you know, inner layers. And then increasingly refined lacquer is applied as the outer coats, each layer being polished uh, between the others as they're, as they're built up to achieve, finally, a very highly lustrous surface on the final layer. Okay, and I have a very brief clip of um, the sprinkle picture process, the maquille process, which is um, used to take fine gold powders or metal powders and sprinkle them onto a wet lacquer that has been painted onto an object. Uh, so the full video is kind of cycling on an iPad in the exhibition, but you can see just a little bit of this, so you have a sense going forward of how the objects I'm showing were, um, were actually decorated. So let's see if, it, if this works. I had it loaded up earlier. Okay, so you can see that the artist is here taking a tube with a filter on it, uh, loading it with the gold uh, powders, and then sprinkling it right through a filter onto the wet lacquer that's been painted onto the, the lid of the tea caddy here. Right? And then that's allowed to harden. Sometimes uh, you know, layers are applied on top to seal it in, and it's uh, polished out uh, to, to show the, the sparkling, beautiful gold beneath. So that's the process then that's used to decorate a large object like this uh, trousseau box uh, in the exhibition. Um, and you can get a sense of the time uh, that's involved in this because not only must you know, each design be sprinkled on, but between each lacquer application, the object has to cure um, for, the, for the layers of lacquer to properly harden uh, to become a finished object. Okay. 
Um, I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, styles of lacquer, uh, because there are many different styles of lacquer decoration. Uh, this one here, represented by the, the trousseau box that's in the exhibition, is referred to as the Kodaiji style. Uh, it's named after a temple in Kyoto, which I've just inserted a picture here just for some visuals. Um, and as you can see, I'm showing these two objects that are in the Metropolitan's collection. Um, it's characterized by, oftentimes, these contrasting zigzag fields of red ground and black ground, um, which creates a kind of abstract effect. And each with, uh, with motifs. Uh, here we have autumnal motifs, which are very common in Kodaiji lacquer decoration, uh, chrysanthemums, uh, autumn flowers and grasses and such. Um, and then here, uh, crests, Paulonia crests, that uh, kind of float on this red ground. Uh, in this one, we don't have just autumn, but we have many, oops, so many different seasons represented uh, on this box, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but in the Kodaiji style, the autumnal um, motifs are, are the most prevalent. And so lacquer also, and this kind of gave it away with my next slide here, um, often come in sets. Right? Uh, so this trousseau box, perhaps would have formed a part of a, a bridal trousseau set. Um, and as you can see, right, it's a wealth of gold uh, in, this, in this set that would accompany a, um, a daughter of a daimyo or warlord, regional lord, feudal lord family into marriage um, during the, the Edo period, right? so from the 17th to the 19th century. Um, and so when we see an individual box like this, um, we have to picture them as part of, you know, larger collections. And you can imagine, you know, the, uh, the expense and, and the, the time required to create a whole set like this. Uh, the Edo period was a time of great peace in Japan. It was a feudal period where you had the um, regional lords, right, loyal to the Tokugawa shoguns ruling from, from Edo, from Tokyo. Um, and uh, part of the um, government system at the time was to have the, the daimyo, the regional lords, come to Tokyo periodically. And so they had to maintain households, not only in Tokyo, then Edo, but also in their home domains. Um, and so one can imagine this is, uh, you know, the, the central shogunal re regime is encouraging um, spending on these kinds of processions, weddings, lacquer sets, as opposed to spending on things like arms, armies, building up insurrections to somehow challenge the Tokugawa themselves. Right. Now at the same time, of course, sumptuary laws, right, laws restricting the ownership of um, luxury goods were also a part of the Tokugawa's effort to maintain control. And so not everyone could own commission by uh, sets of lacquer like this. Right? Um, and to get a sense of how these would uh, function in interiors, we can again turn to scrolls. Now we're looking at a mid-17th century scroll that's in the Spencer collection of the New York Public Library and was part of the wonderful Metropolitan uh, show of the Tale of Genji, um, which I believe that was just last spring, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so this is a, a fictional scene, but displaying perhaps what a 17th century interior with complete with lacquerwares might have looked like. Um, we can see the uh, main characters here are using a writing box, right? Uh, he's actually painting. Uh, a picture for her. We see a mirror stand that's decorated with with sprinkle picture uh, gold here with a drawer. Uh, we see a box uh, almost like the one in in the show, right, with its uh, silk threads tying it up here, and more storage boxes back here, placed on the shelf uh, and in this alcove. So again, I'm I'm seeing lacquer everywhere now as I look at these things. <laughs> Uh, but to speak a little bit about seasonal motifs, and again, I'm using this box because it's nicely going to take us from the winter, uh, which we're in now, through into the spring um, for the, the end of the exhibition. 
Um, so some common motifs that you see here are pines. Um, here on this contrasting field, we have wisteria, right, for spring. On the top of the box, uh, both cherry blossoms and plum blossoms. They're shown here, both uh, winter into early spring for the cherry blossoms. Uh, along with the, the seasonal motifs, and here, I forgot to point out this, this is for where we are right now, right? Bamboo with snow for, for winter. Um, auspicious motifs that would also complement, let's say, a wedding uh, or celebratory occasion are cranes, as you can see here, a pair of cranes and another one flying up here, um, as well as tortoises. These signify uh, long life, longevity, good fortune, auspicious wishes, perhaps for the bride and groom. Um, and I'm not entirely sure, but there are three little birds here in the tree, um, which I'm not sure if they're baby cranes awaiting this one or some other kind of bird, uh, but that perhaps works into that, that same um, theme of happy wishes for, for uh, a, a bride and groom. Um, also in the show, we have a number of, of works um, more recent that have seasonal associations as well. Uh, these two tea caddies, this one with maple leaves uh, that are in a kind of a golden spiral. Um, and I kept thinking of this one this fall as I would see the leaves uh, kind of plastered on my driveway after a rain, uh, you know, shining. It really kept bringing this one to mind. Here we have a more abstract design of plum blossoms um, on a black tea caddy. And again, plum blossom blooming in, in, in late winter, early spring. Uh, this one combines also several seasonal motifs. It's called the snow, moon, and flowers theme. The moon is associated with autumn. It, it uh, represents the, the autumn season. Uh, the cherry blossoms, of course, with spring. And snow here for winter is shown graphically by this character for Yuki, snow, uh, in the middle of the box. Uh, and also, the, the cherry blossoms cascading here um, recalls a kind of poetic conceit of the confusion between snow and cherry blossoms, right? Cherry blossoms falling from the trees like snow. Uh, the, this is the box that kind of started it all, the, the writing box with, the, with cranes that the museum acquired uh, and that was the inspiration for this exhibition. Um, the inside of this box has also a decidedly autumnal theme. Um, the red, sparse uh, uh, background here kind of evokes an autumn color, and the chrysanthemums, autumn grasses, uh, and other autumn-related plants depicted on the inside of the box brings up autumn. Cranes, again, relate to those auspicious motifs I just mentioned. Um, so perhaps uh, for the new year, perhaps for a wedding, other celebratory uh, occasion on which good, you know, good wishes and felicity is, is desired. I'm showing you also the inside of this box. It's a little bit hard to see in the exhibition uh, the, the full beauty of the, the inside of this lid, um, which contrasts really strongly with the black, kind of strong contrast of the, the outside with the gold cranes against the black background. We have a much softer effect here on the inside with this uh, diagonal of uh, autumn flowers with little bugs, these uh, I think are bell crickets or suzumushi that are also, also associated with autumn um, and were actually captured and held in cages or um, in the tale of Genji, you know, we read that they're released into the gardens of the nobility in the Heian period during autumn to, to sing their song and provide kind of uh, atmospheric effects. Um, so that's what we have here frolicking among these. Um, and then these, these golden clouds here perhaps evoke uh, a meandering stream or, uh, or clouds themselves. So what is a writing box? And here we're turning to, um, again, this idea of, of poetry and writing and lacquerwares. Um, it's a container for an inkstone, right, which we see here, which is used to grind up the ink. And I think I'll just pop forward really quickly to show you this one. Uh, to grind the, the ink stick on the stone, and dilute it with water from the water dropper there, which you can also see up here, uh, to mix with the ink to, to create the ink for writing. Um, writing boxes would also store brushes, 
right, all in, in one package, so you could hold that in there. And some of the writing boxes in the show are stacked and would also provide storage for papers uh, within them. Of course, there are also separate boxes for paper storage, for document storage, for scroll storage that forms part of these kind of sets of lacquerware. So as we can see, you know, grinding the ink and then using this for, uh, for writing on papers. Here we also see perhaps a document storage box right, for the papers themselves, also of lacquer. So this idea of writing then brings me to uh, the literary and poetic themes um, that I want to talk about for the, the remainder of the time. I'll find my place here. Okay, this one I was actually thinking of as I came in here today uh, because it's a winter theme, uh, I think, um, with uh, a horse and rider here. He's holding his sleeve over his head as protection against the elements. Um, the horse looks tired. He's kind of bending his head down uh, as he walks forward. And we see beautifully rendered this court figure with inlaid mother of pearl for the face. Uh, and also used here for the contours of the clothing. Right. Um, and then the horse itself is also using an inlay of a pewter um, that's been further decorated right, with uh, these kinds of designs here. So this is a, a, a poetic theme, and I just want to explain a little bit about uh, poetry before I, I go into this one. I'll just go forward so I can read you one. So this is the poem that, um, that perhaps accompanies this theme. Not even the cover of a tree where I might stop my horse and brush off my sleeves. A twilight of snow here at Sano Crossing. <coughs> so this poem is uh, written by Fujiwara no Teika um, in the 12th to 13th century. As, and as we can see, it's interpreted not just on this box, uh, but also in paintings uh, and in many, many other media. So this image of a courtier on a horse with specifically his head over, his sleeve over his head, immediately starts to evoke right, that particular poem and that particular tradition. Um, and Fujiwara no Teika himself is building on earlier poetry when he composes his verse. So he's looking back to an earlier poem from the eighth century about the Sano crossing and encountering rain and not finding shelter. So in that way, this place that's named in this poem here, the Sano crossing, builds up these associations of bad weather, right? whether it be rain or then snow in Teika's poem. Um, and so any further poem then on the theme of Sano is going to build on that theme as well and evoke these earlier poems. Uh, just like the pictorial tradition, whether it be in lacquerware or in painting or in other media, are then also going to build on these prior pictures on this poem. Uh, and there's been a lot of really wonderful work on poetry and painting uh, in, uh, in both fields of art history and in literary studies. And I'm thinking specifically of Ed Kamins' Waka as Things, Things as Waka, a recent book where he looks at the material culture of poetry. So poetry are not just literary works that exist you know, in, um, in anthologies and such, but that they're intimately associated with things, whether those things be writing boxes, um, you know, poetry slips, screens onto which those poetry slips are pasted. Uh, the theme even gets picked up in woodblock prints, um, a popular medium, uh, easily reproducible, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and I love this one by uh, Suzuki Harunobu in uh, 1765, which again parodies, or in, in Japanese, a mitate, right? Builds upon that earlier theme, now substituting uh, a young lady for the courtier, but also with the sleeve over her head, right, at Asano. Uh, and this is actually a calendar print, so here the, um, the dates of the short and the long months would be in, are embedded into the, the bridge, and these would be kind of privately commissioned among 
literary circles um, and then circulated. And it was a kind of game or a way to display your erudition and your, your wit to recognize these prints, recognize the poetic references that they speak to from the classical tradition. Um, so we see uh, iterations like this that relate to uh, these lacquer ways as well. And the woodblock medium was also used to transmit uh, lacquer designs. Um, and so lacquer designers and artists um, would you know, make famous designs and they would be uh, recorded in books like this. Um, this happens to be a, a book that compiles the designs of Korin, uh, a Rinpa school artist, um, showing you know, the Sano crossing and how to depict this particular thing. Of course, it's not the same one as, as the box we see here, um, but a, a, another iteration on this Sano crossing theme. All evoking you know, the soul figure on horseback, this idea of loneliness, of bad weather, uh, the traveler far from home. Okay, then um, getting into the eight views of Omi, uh, we have this wonderful screen on display uh, paired with a lacquer box depicting the same theme of the eight views of Omi. Uh, and this is another poetic theme. Uh, Omi, which is now Shiga province, is a real place. Uh, all the places depicted within each of these are real places. Um, but it carries the weight of this really long poetic and pictorial tradition so that anyone <coughs> designing, painting and a view of Omi in 1910 um, is building upon a tradition that dates back to the 16th century in Japan um, and then, as I'll show, even back earlier in the Chinese painting tradition. So again, as I said, Omi is a real place. Uh, it's now called Shiga, uh, Lake Biwa, the main lake that forms you know, part of so many of the Omi views, uh, is uh, Japan's largest lake. You can see just how big it is right here. Um, and it was a uh, popular spot for pilgrimage to the various temples that surround the lake. Uh, the one that I worked on for my own dissertation, Ishiyama Dera, is depicted as one of the eight views of Omi itself, uh, a place where people would come from Kyoto on pilgrimage um, you know, quite frequently here. Um, and it was also depicted in popular print series, again, in the 19th century. A number of series by Hiroshige, not just this one, he did on the, on the eight views of Omi theme. Um, here showing uh, the temple Ishiyama, always with the full moon, always associated with autumn. Um, and here, the theme of sunset glow at Seta, showing the Seta Bridge. Uh, and here she has included the poems themselves, because each one of these eight views that become codified has a poem that it's associated with. Right, so any interpretation of this theme is going to refer, whether it includes the poem or not, it's going to invoke in the mind of the viewer this particular poem, this particular scene. Um, this one, I, I put in this link, I'll just pull it up because many of you might get a, a kick out of it. Uh, this is a project actually done by an undergraduate um, who's created a map of, uh, of ukiyo-e prints and where they, the scenes that they actually show. Um, and he's just added the eight views of Omi. So if this were to load, we could actually mouse over Lake Biwa here and see where these particular eight views are. So this would be even rain at Karasaki here. Evening bell at Midera, the temple here. Down here. Clear breeze at Awazu. So he's, he's really mapped these prints onto uh, the different locations. Kind of fun. Uh, and if you're interested in the 53 stations of the Tokaido, that's on there as well, so you can go and look those up. Um, and the 36 views of Mount Fuji, of course, by Hokusai as well. But that's to say that the artists representing these places um, are not so much thinking about the real places as they're thinking about the artistic and the poetic tradition 
uh, that has evolved through centuries when they're putting together the eight views of Omi, whether in one composition or in eight separate ones. Now, how do I get back to my slideshow? So let me uh, show you just a few of these, um, and I've taken just details of the screen. Uh, the artist of the screen, Hasagawa Gyokujin, actually did live in Otsu for, uh, for a while. Um, so, you know, perhaps that also um, influenced his thinking about this, this particular theme as well. Otsu being a town on the shore of Lake Biwa in what used to be Omi province. So each of these views has an associated poem. Uh, this is Evening Snow at Hida. Um, and I pull up you know, kind of pictures of these that evoke. Here is uh, Hira depicted in the lacquer box on the inside of this writing box lid. Uh, and then here, the scene from the, the screen. Uh, and here's that same confusion of snow and blossoms that I mentioned with the portable tea set that we saw earlier, where the cherry blossoms and the snow get kind of poetically confused. We also see that happening here. Uh, snowy peak is a spring which surpasses even the blossoms peak. So it's referencing that same, that same poetic conceit. Uh, descending geese at Katara, right, a motif that we see here, um, often depicted with this uh, moon viewing pavilion. So you have these little icons that signal that this is the view that's being represented, right? The descending geese and the pavilion. Um, the Karasaki pine, its voice lifted in the gathering evening breezes, defers to the sound of the night rain. So these very kind of atmospheric ink washes here. Um, and then in this lacquer box, shown by the pine and then the indication of a kind of a driving rain here uh, in the metal itself. The poems themselves are very evocative of uh, evening moods generally, uh, winter appears very frequently, um, autumn in the Ishiyama scene as well. So you get an evocation of a season, uh, a weather you know, event or atmosphere with these poems. So as I mentioned, uh, the uh, Hasegawa Gyokujin in 1910, when he's painting in the tents, when he's painting the screen, uh, is also harkening back to a much older tradition of painting the eight views of Omi. I know it's hard to see the whole screen here, so I've given you a detail of the scene of Ishiyama Temple, of a monochrome ink painting of the eight views of Omi. That combines them into a single composition, much like the uh, lacquer box here does, where it takes the eight views and puts them into one kind of unified landscape. Although they don't appear like that in reality, it's an imaginary landscape, right? But even this theme has more ancient precedents. It goes back to Chinese themes um, and ink paintings of a region in China, uh, a poetic theme of the eight views of the Xiao and Xiang came into Japan in uh, the medieval period uh, and became very popular in shogunate collections and influenced painters in Japan, like Kana Motonobu, who's painting here a scene he's probably never seen in China, but he's building upon those Chinese landscape paintings that he's seen to create this eight views of the Xiao and the Xiang region. Uh, and so that gets mapped onto the Japanese landscape around Omi. So they're taking each of these eight views from the Chinese painting theme and uh, recreating them with scenes around uh, Omi province itself. And this, I'll just go quickly through this, this is a, a Chinese painting of the kind that would be referenced in the, um, in the eight views theme. Now Ishiyama, the temple at Ishiyama, again always uh, referenced by the full autumn moon, um, has a lot of other literary associations besides the eight views of Omi poetic tradition. Um, this is the famous temple where the author Murasaki Shikibu is supposed to have conceived the tale of Genji, this uh, novel, court romance that she writes around the year 1000. Um, and the legend goes that she was on pilgrimage to this temple, Ishiyama, 
uh, when she looked out over the lake under a full moon and uh, was inspired to write the two core kind of key chapters of the tale of Genji and, and build it out from there. Uh, so the poem in the, in the Eight Views sequence that uh, talks about Ishiyama also references Akashi and Suma. Right? The glow of the moon across Lake Biwa, there's an old word for that, can be none other than the light that fell on Akashi and Suma. <coughs> Akashi and Suma are places in the fictional tale that she writes. Um, and at the temple, they actually have a, a room that is dedicated to her, um, commemorating her you know, being there and, and writing this tale. Whether that actually happened or not, uh, that is the, the long tradition of, of the origin of this tale. And so we can see that here in this depicted temple. So this writing box then would evoke the tale of Genji by its poetic reference and by depicting this particular temple of, of Ishiyama. Uh, another box that's in the exhibition here actually depicts a scene from the tale of Genji. Um, here, on the lid, right, we see a, uh, a cart, um, a group of courtiers here, one who's perhaps carrying a, maybe a lacquer tray, a box of some sort, and then a boat with two women here in the background, a shrine gate, uh, a shore with pines. So this is another common motif, one that would evoke in the mind of a viewer steeped in the Genji tradition a particular chapter, a particular scene, uh, which is Genji's pilgrimage to Sumiyoshi Shrine, um, where he comes to thank the gods for his recent good fortune after having been uh, exiled for a number of years. And while he's there on pilgrimage, his former lover, the Akashi lady, comes on her own pilgrimage, quite by coincidence. Uh, she's really embarrassed that she didn't know he was going to be there. There's a difference in their social status, and so she doesn't dare to come and, you know, say hi, right, to, to Genji's party. She can't, she can't do that. Um, he also doesn't know she's there, but they end up exchanging poems. Um, and so it speaks of, of, to poetry as a communication, and if you read the tale of Genji, the characters are constantly sending poems back and forth to one another. And many of the chapter titles in the Tale of Genji then take their titles from these poems that are, that are written in the tale itself. Um, so just to show another composition and reference the box, uh, here's what Genji writes to the Akashi lady. How deep the destiny that guides our hearts, like the channel markers leading us here, showing how deeply I channeled my love. So the title, the, the, the chapter that this comes from is called The Channel Markers and taking its title from this poem. And like the Omi compositions, these become codified, right? Here we have a fan painting uh, that shows a similar scene of carts, uh, a courtly entourage, a shrine gate, and a pine-laden shore uh, depicting this particular chapter. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, titles often take their um, the, the chapter titles reference poems in that particular chapter. Uh, this is a, a, a medicine container that's, uh, that's in the exhibition. It's a little thing that looks larger than life up here. Um, but when you see it, look closely because it has 54 little cards, little squares, each depicting a kind of canonical motif from a particular chapter of the tale of Genji. Um, and they also have cartouches or little labels, just in case you don't recognize the full motif, <laughs> or if it's hidden you know, behind here and you can't quite see it, uh, labeling the, the chapter title itself. Um, and so it's really delightful to, to look at this thing closely and then that kind of joy of recognizing the motifs and, and reading the titles and saying, oh yeah, I know that. You know, I don't quite know what to compare it to in, in, um, in the Western tradition, but it's, a, uh, it's, it's really a, a lovely object to look at uh, and look at for a long time closely. And it fits in the palm of your hand, right? It's a very small object, so it's an intimate uh, object. Now, what kind of object is this? Many of you may be familiar with uh, Indro. These are medicine cases, pill boxes. Oh, there I go again. 
that would be worn um, suspended from the belt of a of menswear, of a men's kimono in uh, the Edo period. Uh, and so they would be luxurious productions, um, specialized lacquer workshops that you know, worked on producing only inro existed. Um, because they're so small, and you have to have such fine, detailed work. And they really spoke to the wearer's um, erudition, wit, style, fashion sense, um, you know, whether you're wearing an ingro with classical motifs or something that was perhaps a, you know, really up-to-date and surprising design. Um, and so it's a fashion accessory, as well as being an object that you know, references ancient poetry and literary traditions. Um, but the motif that's shown on here, I mentioned briefly, are poem cards, uh, shikishi, these square shaped, and then there are other ones that are rectangular, tanzaku, um, which is a common motif in lacquer decoration. And it speaks to the kind of uh, intermediality of these objects, where you have um, painted things, paper things, that are represented in lacquer, on lacquer objects, some of which then are used to produce or store those very painted, poetic uh, things. Um, shikishi were used not only in lacquer decoration, but these are actual poem cards that are pasted onto a large string. It was a way of uh, preserving these uh, pairing them and creating these compositions that play with the idea of surface and ground, uh, having you know written things on decorated papers that are then on you know a golden screen with a painted picture behind it. On the in the exhibition, we also have this uh, large document storage box and a, a writing box. Again, thinking about these in sets. Uh, that also have poem cards depicted on them, as if they were just kind of scattered across the surface, um, overlapping and with varied designs. Um, I'm not sure if these have specific literary references, but you see seasonal plants, uh, courtly motifs, even um, calligraphy being written on these decorated papers. Um, and there's a lot of synergy between paper decoration and lacquer decoration, if you think about it. The papers themselves would be decorated with gold uh, powders, silver powders, uh, cut gold squares, uh, just as the lacquer decoration itself is. Um, there are also these uh, miniature containers for square and rectangular poem papers. And again, these are teeny tiny, so get up close to them uh, and look at them. Uh, the motif of water wheels and a bridge that you see here is also shown on huge screens, taking it from the teeny, teeny, tiny, the same motif, to uh, you know, the very large um, on this pair of, of golden screens um, that are at the, the mat. So again, the delight is in recognizing this motif. Ah, the water wheels, the willow, the bridge. Ah, this is Uji Bridge, which takes us again back to the tale of Genji, because part of the tale is set in Uji. And so it brings up all of those references as well. And this slide, I'm just showing a selection of these uh, poem papers and how they appear in different media. Here is a poem, a calligraphy written on one that's been mounted as a hanging scroll. Right. Here is actually a kimono that's decorated with um, poem papers with calligraphy on them. And in this print um, here, you can see not only what's perhaps a lacquered writing desk of sorts here, where she's holding onto these um, papers on which poems are written, but I love the way that the title cartouches here playfully echo the poem papers themselves. So it plays with that idea of this is an actual object represented within the composition, and this is a kind of surface cartouche that identifies the print and the scene that's being depicted here. Likewise with the fan that she holds here, and the way these motifs are set into these fan shapes uh, on the print itself. Um, and then if you want to uh, keep going with the references, these are eight views of Omi. <laughs> which are matched with eight scenes or chapters from Genji, and you can build back on those, uh, those long literary references as well in these. 
fans, uh, this brings us to fans, is another motif that we see commonly on uh, lacquerware's textiles, boxes, prints, uh, both as objects held by people, uh, as we saw in that early court scene with the poetry gathering where the gentleman's holding a fan, um, two used as decorative motifs for, again, one of the eight views of Omi here, um, or as decoration on this uh, stacked writing box with a, a little drawer here. Um, and again, fans themselves were also pasted onto large screens, uh, creating um, golden compositions across here. Okay, I just want to very briefly finish by mentioning um, the textiles that we also have in the adjacent gallery uh, to the show. Speaking of screens, the same painter of these fan screens also created these, which um, uh, were um, picked up many, many times, both in lacquer decoration and in, uh, in textile designs, and is the motif that probably inspired um, this kimono here that's on display in the gallery. Uh, likewise, the same kinds of auspicious motifs of cranes, uh, open books here with carts like the one you saw in the Genji writing box. Um, here is a, uh, another box with a design of books on a wood grain surface um, that we see here. And then of course seasonal motifs like chrysanthemums, maple leaves, cherry blossoms uh, that are picked up in textile design as well. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk, I'm giving another gallery talk later where I'll talk more about the, the um, uh, synergy between textile design and lacquer design later on in the semester. Um, but I think I'll just uh, leave you with that. I know the exhibition is going to be opening soon. Uh, please save the date on April 8th, uh, that's a Wednesday, for a talk by Monica Binsick, who's a curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and a specialist in lacquerware. Um, she will be here um, speaking to us, so I encourage you all to come back for that lecture, as well as the other wonderful programs that we have, uh, both around this show and the other shows open this semester. So thank you very much. Enjoy the reception.